Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed. Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it. Live from the City Winery. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I am Ryan Nicodemus. And together we are the Minimalists live in Nashville. Yeah. Come on, Nashville. You can do better than that. I said we are live in Nashville. That was much better. Thank you so much for being here. We have to, this, this place is amazing. So next time we'll have to do like two nights because you all sold this out like months in advance. So thank you so much for being here. We've got some folks with some questions. And Ryan, do you have any answers? I've got, I've got a few answers. I hope one of them works. I can I borrow one? <laughs> sure. Howdy, what's your name? Where are you from? Hey there, I'm Tashana. I'm from Kansas City. Represent. Okay. <laughs> the Missouri side, okay? There is a difference. Um, anyway, Welcome. I appreciate your presence and uh, appreciate your message. Um, I've been de- decluttering a lot, and my husband is here. He was drug with me. Um, Thanks so, for being drugged. So uh, maybe he'll get the bug too. So we have three kids, and we're working on uh, decluttering them as well. So working on that. Hey, I found something that kind of sort of works with them. I just kind of packed up a bunch of their toys in a bin and kept it in the garage for a month, and nobody noticed any of that stuff was gone. So then it went to Goodwill. So I don't, anyway. <laughs> But my question is really more about work. Sometimes you guys talk about mental clutter. And so I work as a nurse, and kind of everything I feel like falls to the nurse. Like, oh, ask the nurse. The doctor's not going to deal with this. The scheduling person doesn't want to deal with it. The you know, person up front, they're like, oh, the nurse. Ask the nurse. Ask the nurse. So it's just this barrage of I do have decision fatigue just from you know, all this stuff. And I feel like it's hard for me to let that go and decompress and then when I go home and, and with my kids and my husband, it's hard to be present because I'm still cluttered in my mind with all the works. Sure, it bleeds over into your personal life, yeah. for sure. And, and, and so uh, you are quite often the catch-all for, for everything else yes. that, that either people don't want to do, can't do, whatever. Um, and here's the good, so first off, thank you for doing what, you, what you're doing. It's a really important job. Thanks. And I'm certainly grateful for that. Um, and and here's, here's what I'll say is because it is so important, there, there's, a, there's a lot of weight on, on your shoulders, right? Mm-hmm. And so it seems to me that the, the, the clutter that you're feeling internally, it's mm-hmm. emotional clutter, it's yeah. mental clutter, it's, it's everything that's going on inside. And what I've realized is what you're, what you're doing is important. And so the thing for, for me, it took me a long time to, to realize this. Like, and in fact, I'll tell you, like, it wasn't until maybe this year um, while we were out on the road and I, I really felt like, wow, this is, I mean, I don't believe like, in, well, you, you were born to do one thing for the rest of your life or you were born, you know, you were predetermined to be an astronaut or a yoga teacher or a writer. Yeah, I was really born for this, but I really felt like, wow, this is what I'm supposed to be doing right now. Like this is one of the most important things I could be doing with my time. And, and you're doing that right now. And, and the thing that, that I think will help you is accepting that you actually do have the answers. That's why people are coming to you. It's not just so they can pawn work off on you. It's because they, they I mean, maybe it's, it is sometimes, but, but really they, they need to lean on you for your expertise and your ability to, to do what other people can't do. And so people are there because they need your help, whether it's patients or doctors or administration, they all need your help. And that's a lot of responsibility. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the good news is that's a good thing because the opposite of having none of that responsibility means you're probably not doing something nearly as meaningful. Have you heard of the 2020 rule? I'm kidding. <laughs> it's, one Why, yes. three answer- it's one of the three answers I brought. No. Um, <laughs> First off, thank you so much for coming here to support us. It means yeah. so much to us, uh, to everyone here. Um, so yeah, th- uh, thank you for that. W- what I'll say is uh, one thing that Josh said that really stuck out to me is uh, the weight on your shoulders. And a lot of times we find ourselves in life where we do have a ton of weight on our shoulders. 
And often I have to remind myself when I start to feel that weight, I've got to remind myself that some of that stuff that's on my shoulders, I can take off. And any boulder that I've picked up, I am able to, to take off. Some of the, your kids, you can't really put those boulders down. Or I wouldn't recommend it at least. <laughs> um, but what I'll say is, is uh, when I'm thinking about your situation, um, my first thought is, is like, what boulders do you have that you've picked up that you can absolutely set down? And sometimes that means letting down some friends and family. But the good news is, is that your friends and family, they love you and they want you to be happy. And the ones that truly do love you and want you to be happy, they will support you. And it's okay if you tell them uh, no a little bit more often. Sure. Um, the other thing I was thinking about too is you know, how, how do you approach this? Because it's, you know, it's work that's stressing you out. You can't just quit your job. Right. And uh, you've got your other weight on, on your shoulders when you, when you come home and you, you can't get rid of your family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> the, qu the, the question that I'm asking myself is, is like, where is, where is there somewhere in your day that can give? So uh, with your family... Maybe it does. It seems like you have a very supportive husband, oh, by yeah. the way. The fact yeah, yeah, that yeah. <laughs> he, he let you uh, drag him out here. So that right now, right there, you have more than what mm -hmm. most people don't have, which is a supportive partner. So that alone is, is a huge leg up. Um, the other thing I'll say, too, is that as your supportive partner, he's, he wants you to unwind. Sure. So is there something in the daily routine that, mm -hmm. that uh, you guys can talk about to maybe help you unwind a little bit more? I don't know if you meditate or um, just going on a walk to decompress. I mean, there are, those are two things I definitely do when I am feeling overwhelmed. Well, then the oh, go ahead. Well, I, on that same topic, you see, you kind of talk about these interstitial zones sometimes. I remember when I worked in the corporate world, I'm an introvert. And so I don't know if you're introvert, extrovert, or somewhere in between. Um, but my job was very extroverted, like 16 hours a day extroverted. And it was weird. I, I didn't realize this until very recently. I was back in Dayton, Ohio, driving around. One of the routes that I would drive, because I've managed a bunch of these retail stores, which is really ironic with the whole minimalism thing. <laughs> um, and, and I was driving on the same road that I drove a million times going between these different stores. And I realized like, I felt at peace in my car, like commuting. I'm like, Why does this feel so good? Because it was one of the only times throughout my entire 16 hour work days that I was by myself. It, that was my decompression zone. Mm -hmm. And so maybe for you, you also have a decompression zone. Mm -hmm. And it may, it may mean, you, you may or may not have one on your commute, or maybe the commute isn't a long enough decompression zone, mm -hmm. but then, then it, 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 maybe there's some other interstitial zone that you can still decompress in. I mean, even today, well, we're out on the road and our partners are with us. Bex was with me. We were walking around all, all downtown today. And then afterward, I'm like, I got to take a nap before we go like, do this. I just need to spend some time. And we're back in, in, in the hotel room and like she's there just talking 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 and then she looks at me because she's understanding and she goes you want me to leave you the fuck alone right now don't you <laughs> i'm like well i just want to go to sleep so unless you want to go to sleep <laughs> um and i think part of that is 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 refining our communication with each other so we can have those sort of fun moments instead of me saying hey leave me alone yeah. it's it's also realizing it, being more aware of of what's going on around us and asking the people who are with us to be to be more aware as well to help out and and sometimes like, even with Ella like uh, Beck's like I can tell like she wants to go you know the gym or something like hey let me grab Ella for a couple hours and you go do whatever you need to do and uh, Ella will ask me like why why are, why are we going to the coffee shop or whatever I'm like because your mom needs some alone time and I think if we can all help give each other what we need we'll all be better off because of it. Yeah, I, I, the other thing I was going to say is um, the other factor is your job, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember when Josh and I were in the corporate world and I started to see those changes in him. Like one of the, one of the changes I remember very clearly was is he, he set expectations with our boss mm -hmm. that he wasn't going to answer the phone after a certain time mm -hmm. and he wasn't going to you know, answer the phone or return emails uh, before a certain time, so he gave them a window. Um, the funniest story um, is he was out to dinner with a friend Christmas Eve, and it's like 6 o'clock at night. The retail stores are about to close at 8 p.m. So Josh is out with his friend. Our boss calls him. Josh ignores it. He calls back. Josh ignores it. He calls again. And finally, you know, Josh picks up the phone. Hey, 
what can I do for you? He's like, hey, man, what, what, is, what is going on with you? I, I, need, I need your sales numbers right now. What, where are your stores at? And Josh was like, I don't know the answer to that. The stores are closing in two hours. You're going to have that report in two hours. I, I, I don't have that answer. I'm sorry. And he goes, well, that's ridiculous. My boss, he wants the numbers. I need the numbers right now. And Josh said, well, you need to tell your boss that that's an unreasonable expectation. <laughs> now, the only reason why Josh could get away with anything like that, mm -hmm. and he, he was very respectful. I mean, it wasn't patronizing. It was a very professional call. Um, is because Josh added a ton of value to the company. So for you or anyone else out there, if you know that you are adding a ton of value for your company, and, and you know who you are, you have leverage. And that leverage, it's not to say, hey, I want to par work part-time and I want you to double my pay, right? That's silly. Yeah. But there are things, there are reasonable things that you can ask for that if you're adding value, your boss, their boss, will go way out of their way to support you and to keep you on, on staff. So I, I don't think there's like one, sure. it's, it's not like meditation is this magic yeah. bullet answer that's gonna mm -hmm. fix everything. But I think if you can kind of look at both parts mm -hmm. and you know, kind of pick and choose a, f a few things with the support of a great partner, yeah. I think you could totally take, you know, get that metal, mental, clunder, uh, metal, <laughs> mental clutter, say that five times fast, uh, <laughs> you can definitely uh, declutter that mental clutter um, a, a little bit more than what you're doing now. Awesome. Thank you for your help. Thank, Thank you. you. Howdy. What's your name? Hi, guys. I'm Beth. Where are you uh, from? I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah. Nice. yeah Kentucky's Louisville. in the house tonight? Yeah. Yeah. That's well, awesome. we're not that far, you know. No, I know. Um, first off, I'm one of those factory workers that you all talk about so often. Um, but anyways, on to my question, and I am so glad your female, your uh, ladies are here today because this question is probably better answered by them. When it comes to makeup... Don't worry, I'll answer for them. <laughs> <laughs> like I always do. <laughs> but when it comes to makeup and hair products and all of those things, especially as a single woman... You know, I like to uh, put my best foot forward and look my best. How can I make mindful decisions and minimize, you know, my consumption when it comes to those kind of products? Cosmetics in general. Yeah. Uh, so, so what, what are you struggling with? Like, I want to make mindful decisions. I want to buy products that are ecologically friendly, you know. I don't want to have a bunch of things that I'm not using that, you know, society tells us that we need. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, well, th that's the interesting thing because I, I saw Bex tonight when, when she was, she was like putting some mascara on and uh, she very, wears very little makeup and I fully support her in whatever she wants to wear. She could put a clown nose on. Um, she could borrow mine. I, I wear it sometimes around the house um, and I fully support her. But um, yeah, I, I think she's totally beautiful without a drop of makeup on her face whatsoever. Um, and, it's like that Macklemore line. It was like the, the greatest lie ever sold is that women look better in makeup. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I feel that way. It, like, it, it's, it seems superfluous to me, but that's just my personal opinion. And I also realize that, that people have certain preferences. And so I, I support her in whatever, whatever her preferences are. She doesn't wear a whole lot of makeup, but if she wanted to, I'd say, okay, whatever, do whatever you want to do, whatever you find value, what brings you joy. And I'm not going to judge that. Um, here, here's the thing that you have to realize. Most of that pressure that you feel, that societal pressure, is internal pressure. Uh, and and we, we think other people give a shit about what we're wearing, but they don't care at all. <laughs> Ryan wears a black shirt and jeans every day, and I mean, people are rarely going to come up to him, hey, man, why are you wearing a black shirt today? Uh, and, and the truth is, like, People don't really care. And, if, and when they, in the rare instances where they do care, they, it says a whole lot more about them than it does about you. We had a, a friend, her name is Nina. She lives in Chicago, and she was a, a HR manager for a, a large pharmaceutical company. Um, and uh, she did this experiment for, uh, I think it was a year, 
she wore the same outfit for a year. And it wasn't like Ryan where it's like, oh, it's pretty simple or whatever. And, and we have that stigma where like, well, women have to dress, you know, especially for the occasion and, and really you stand up. But she wore a bright red sweater and black pants every day for a year. And one person commented <laughs> the entire time, hey, didn't you wear that earlier this week? <laughs> and, and what she found out is like, oh, man, all this pressure that I've been putting on myself all these years, the makeup, the clothes, the appearance, I feel the pressure. And if I picked it up, then I can let it go. Man, now I really do want to talk about the 2020 rule. <laughs> um, well, I mean, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. When makeup or like artists, they will reach out to me a lot. And what do I do with all these art supplies? I don't know what rules are going to work best for you, but you've got to come up with some, some kind of guidelines to work off of. So the, the 2020 rule, you know, Josh and I, we basically have this theory. Our, theory, our, our guess is it works like 99% of the time. It, it has worked 100% of the time for both of us. But the idea is anything that you hold on to just in case, art supplies, makeup, anything else that you hold on to just in case, you can replace for less than $20 in less than, than 20 minutes. Now, maybe that is a rule that doesn't work for you, and that's okay. But what, what rules are going to work for you? Um, Josh and I, we talk a lot about the 90-90 rule, where if there's something I haven't worn, used, you know, done something with in the last 90 days and I'm going through it, you know, the junk drawer, and I find that one USB cord, extra USB cord that came with something, and I'm like, yeah, I've got plenty of those, probably not going to use this in the next 90 days, then, then I'll get rid of it. Again, maybe the 90-90 rule doesn't work for you, but maybe it's, you know, six months. Maybe it's the 180-180 rule. So you've, you've got to find some kind of foundation to build off of to, to, to help guide you through when you're making all of these decisions. The other thing I want to say, too, is... If you ever are buying a product, if you're ever putting on makeup, if you're ever you know, consuming something just because you think someone else is going to like you more for that, that's probably the person you don't want to hang out with. Yeah. And, and, it's, and, it's, and I'm not judging that person. It's just that that sounds like it's probably not something, a friendship that you want to foster. So I would, I, I would really, at any time I ask that question or I'll tell that to myself, oh, if I get this one thing, oh man, if I get a, a really dark black t-shirt, Josh will like me so much more. <laughs> no, I don't think about that, but I'll tell you, I think about it with my car. I mean, I live in, we live in LA now, so a lot of nice cars driving around LA. In fact, uh, Mariah and I, our uh, 2004 Toyota Corolla that's in the garage is by far like the crappiest car <laughs> That's in the garage. Well, I mean, I have a 2000 Ford Ranger, so I know how it is. <laughs> yeah, so you get me on this. It's like, I don't have a car payment. I love it. And never in a million years would I go out and bring on more debt just so I can impress people that I really don't care about. Yeah. Awesome. Thank yeah. you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. One second before we, we, we move on here. Um, so for those of you who came early, you got a special treat. Can we give it up for Griffin House, who was here tonight? And, and so we, we have something called an added value segment we usually have at the, the end of the episode. But since we're here in Nashville and we, we dragged Griffin out here tonight, he's legitimately one of our, our favorite musicians. I've, I've seen him like 20 times live, like in the craziest places. Like I drove to Muncie, Indiana once to, to watch him. And... Uh, so Ryan earlier, when he introduced him, said it was like three dozen times, and we tried to do the math, and, and I think we're just a few times shy of that. It's called hyperbole. Yeah, but if we get him to come out and play one more time, it'll be really close to that three oh, dozen yeah, mark. Oh, yeah, you're right. So how about we have Griffin House come out and play a song for us tonight? Yeah. He's right there. Wherever you want, right here. Would you please? <laughs> oh, yeah. 
Yeah, Griffin's going to play an outstanding song from his third album. That's right. It's called Better Than Love. Check one, two, one, two. All set? I'm set if you're set. All right. We will not be singing along. I want this thing fun. <laughs> not I'm this time. Thinking, I don't know what's going to happen <laughs> with this guy over here. <laughs> All right. Honey, when you doubt my love for you Look into my eyes what I'm going through Even if we change and fall out of You hold my hand and it's better than love You save me from myself Got my back when I need help There's no one else in the world And you will always be my girl You will always be You will always be You will always be my girl Sometimes dreams, they don't come true I was scared of that when I met you But I stayed patient and I was kind Telling you to take your time You turned my life around You made it okay to let you down no one else in the world And you will always be my girl You will always be You will always be You will always be my girl I can't understand the things you do and Nothing turns out the way we planned You're still my baby and I'm still your man You save me from myself You got my back when I need help There's no one else in the world and you will always be my girl you will always be you will always be you will always be my girl If it's okay with, with Griffin here, we'll get him to, we'll have Jess come out here and uh, bring a chair. Maybe we'll get you to stick around for some questions. Sure. That'd be great. Give me a hug, brother. Thanks, man. Thanks so much, man. <laughs> All right. So uh, it's time. Well, what time is it, Ryan? Oh, it is time for our hashtag Ask the Minimalists lightning round where, well, we usually answer questions from social media, but Josh and I will not be on our phones up here. 
in front of you guys. It'd be a bit odd. We, yeah. we, we try to like answer regular questions we, with like these pithy answers. We call them minimal maxims that Jess catalogs over at minimalmaxims.com. They're like these really nice wrap it up in a bow answers, but we don't have those yet. And so we'll just maunder on a bit until we get a, a, a good answer that's tweetable. And hopefully uh, Griffin can help us along the way. Howdy, what's your name? Hi, I'm Olivia. Howdy. I'm from uh, Pennsylvania. I just moved down to Nashville about a year ago. Um, my question, um, I sort of struggled a little bit um, being mindful about food, and I know it's something that you both have talked about at length um, in the podcast. Um, Ryan, I know for you it's been a little bit more of a health thing, but I was wondering if you had any tips for um, sort of um, to be able to like stop looking at food as like entertainment and more um, about being mindful and conscious about it. Yeah, I mean, so, so the pithy answer is food is not entertainment, but let's, let's unpack what that means, right? Um, and Jess, can you grab Griffin's guitar so he doesn't feel like he's gonna just start playing songs? Or, and let, <laughs> although, you know what would be great if like he answered every question with a... He doesn't realize this is like actually my crutch. Uh, freestyle, <laughs> do it with my hands. Oh, it's all right. I can make it without it to be okay. Uh, yeah, Pull and so, so really, well, let's, I mean, we can, we, can, we can move this out a little bit. And, and, uh, so for me, food was a big problem. I weighed 80 pounds more than I weigh now. And it was, it's, a, it's an addiction, right? And, and, and it's a compulsion. And it becomes, it becomes this weird thing where it's a reward system for me um, in two different facets. It was a reward system for me when I achieved something. Oh yeah, let's celebrate. Let's have a shitty meal <laughs> that's really bad for me. Um, and, and, or it, it was, oh, I feel bad about myself. I, and I, I still get this impulse now. Um, when I get overly stressed or I don't sleep well, I, I want to eat unhealthy stuff or just eat in general. Um, and, and so we tend to binge on things that, that taste good. We, we are we're willing to give up long-term health for short-term gain when the opposite should be true. We, we should be willing to give up the short-term pleasure for, for the, the long-term uh, well-lived life, you know, for our long-term well-being. And so, I mean, I, I think ultimately it comes down to talking about not just food, food's part of it, but anything that we, we get addicted to. It could be social media, it can be drugs and alcohol, it can be food. Um, what are our, our pacifiers? And then, and then the question then is, what are the triggers for those pacifiers? And for me, it, it, in order to change it, I had to replace the triggers for me. Um, I ate whenever, you know, you eat, you're supposed to eat breakfast, right? Because it's the most important meal of the day. Which is total nonsense, right? I mean, it, 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 that, that's a lie that we've been sold over many generations. And, and the truth is that breakfast is by far the least important meal of the day. But marketers, advertisers are really good at, at in fact, I mean, it's one of the reasons we don't do advertisers on the podcast is, is advertisers are really good at getting you to buy either stuff you don't need or also stuff that's just bad for you. We, I was listening to, to Chris Kresser talk about this recently. Uh, he has a new book that just came out and I'm blanking on the title. But um, we've re our, our society, marketers, have repackaged waste products. Corn oil, soybean oil. This is food waste. These are things that are supposed to be thrown away. And now that they're, they're calling it food and it's repackaged and it's a cheaper alternative. And no, it's, it's literally trash. And they're selling us back our trash. And so we, we have to be really cognizant about what our habits are. And then how do, I, how do I change those habits? What are my triggers? And so for me, when it comes to health, um, whenever I feel, feel stressed or I want to celebrate, instead of that being the trigger for food, I have to have it be a trigger for something else. So what is your new healthier trigger? And so, yeah, food is not entertainment is my, my pithy answer for you. But there's, there's a little bit more there for you. Either one of you want to? Want to add in? Anything? All right, I'll go if you don't have anything. All right. Um, <clears throat> I don't really have anything either. I'm just going to maunder on. Um, yeah, sugar is really addictive. <laughs> That's my sh pithy answer. No, uh, Mariah and I have been going through this. Um, uh, she just, like, the last two, three years um, has just had some 
uh, digestional health stuff. So I've been trying to support her with different diets. Um, for me, the easiest, well, the easiest way <laughs> that I really got, and I don't suggest you do this, uh, I got control over my, my uh, food impulses uh, was I went vegan for a year on a bet with Josh. Um, he only lasted 11 months and he still owes me a dollar. Um, but I'll tell you, going through that year, um, I, I it totally retrained how I ate. So I broke my, uh, my, my diet with, I remember it was like this nice big piece of cheesecake. Yes, it was from the Cheesecake Factory because that's where you eat in Ohio. Um, and I, I remember like just scarfing this thing down. I was like, oh, this is so good. Like, oh my goodness. Loved it. And then I woke up at like two in the morning and I thought I literally had appendicitis. Like my stomach was hurting so bad. And it's because I had not digested dairy in so long. It's, it was, it caused me a lot of pain. And uh, from there, um, I did not, uh, I, I, I didn't go back to meat. I was just like, oh, I'm not going to see what other stuff does to me. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and like incorporate, you know, some fish back in, so forth and so on. So um, like I said, I don't recommend that you do anything extreme like that. I think you certainly could. But I, I, re the reason why I use that example, though, is because for me it was easier to fast than it was to diet. Is that my pithy answer? Yes. Perfect. <laughs> so it's easier to fast than it is to diet. So what I, what I would suggest that you do is don't, don't again, don't, I'm going to be a vegan and cut everything out. That's crazy. What you've got to do is, you know, pick one thing that you really want to focus on. Is it more vegetables? Is it less sugar? Whatever it is, just kind of focus on one thing at a time. And I'll tell you, with Mariah as an accountability partner, it really, really helps. So find a friend who, or a coworker or an enemy, whoever, <laughs> that also wants to change the way that they eat. And, 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 and just start, you know, kind of piecing it together one thing at a time. But to to go into it as a diet, because if you're going to tell yourself, oh, well, I, I want to lose five pounds, I'm going to go on a diet, and great, you lose five pounds, you come off the diet, you're going to gain the five pounds back. Don't look at it as uh, a temporary diet. Those changes that you make, like, you want to look at those as lifestyle changes. And what I'll tell you is, like, after doing the ketogenic thing, um, after stop eating sugar, like, I, I hardly, God love Mariah, she still craves sugar all the time. Um, but I like, I hardly ever crave it. I'm just waiting for you, honey, before you wake up and you're like, no, I don't want to have a donut. <laughs> um, I mean, and she doesn't eat donuts, by the way, but she still wants to. <laughs> uh, but what I'll say is like, yeah, if you incorporate some of those good habits into your life, it will absolutely train the way that your, your body feels and the way that your brain thinks. And you will actually lose those cravings, but you've got to take some type of massive action and just, like I said, start with one, one thing at a time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Howdy. What's your name, brother? Hey, Josh. Hey, Ryan. Thank you so much for being here, guys. My name is Rock. I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee, born and raised. I was My born in Knoxville. That really? Yeah. Oh, that's right. You were. That's why you came to Knoxville. When I first discovered you guys, I was like, why did they come to Knoxville their first time around? But that makes sense. Two people showed up at that Knoxville stop. <laughs> So my question is less about minimalism and more about the business side of what you guys do. Okay. For someone that is looking to make a living providing inspiration and knowledge like you all do, I absolutely agree that the top priority or one of the top priorities should be adding value like you all talk about. Yeah. However, could you give some more color to the transition between the 52-person blog that you mentioned in your speech to making a living doing what you're doing today? Griffin, we were just backstage talking about this uh, right beforehand. Like, because it's really nice to, to show up. This is actually our second smallest uh, event of the entire tour, and it's great to, to and, and you, 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 you come to a place like this, and um, it's a relatively intimate crowd, but this crowd of three or 400 people here tonight, it would have been by far the largest crowd on our first, second, third, fourth, or fifth tour. Um, that literally that first tour we did 33 cities and when we showed up Knoxville was the fourth city we showed up there and no one showed up it was like this bookstore coffee shop place and and we're like all right well we'll just kind of well, we'll just wait it out a little bit longer a little bit longer and then nope no one's here and we, we as we're leaving we open the door walk out the first down the two steps 
And this couple walks up, hey, you're the minimalists. Sorry, we're late. And I'm like, yes, we are the minimalists. <laughs> and uh, we're here to help. Um, and, and the thing I learned, I, it, I, I don't look at it as like what we do go, is going out and inspiring people or, or maybe, or even influencing. Like what we go out and we do is we tell stories. And a lot of those stories that we tell now, whether it's on the podcast or the live talks that we give, they started because we went out on that 33 city tour and just started talking to people. And more important, we started listening and found out what resonated with people. We tell some great stories uh, that I thought were great. And it would just, people were like, what? Oh, what are you th- that's like I'd have some sort of mixed metaphor and I thought it was really profound. And then all of a sudden Ryan would say, yeah, and then after the packing party and they'd be like, what's a packing party? Like, tell me more about that. And, and you start to realize like, oh, this resonates, this doesn't. This does, this doesn't. And you figure out what does add value to other people's lives. But it, it starts somewhere. It starts with one person. And it just, it's not like we just started a blog and all of a sudden a bunch of people started showing up to these events. Now, this wasn't until pretty recently. And we've been doing this for seven years. And Griffin, I know you've, you've had some years. You, when you, you said... You bought your, your house here in, in Nashville, and one year you slept there 19 nights in a year. And so you're on the road a lot. Yes. <laughs> That's pithy. A man of few words. This is minimalism, after all. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've spent a lot of time on the road, and I still have... I, I jokingly say, but maybe not uh, so much a joke, that I have PTSD from the days where I would show up driving 12 hours to get to Tucson, Arizona, and it wouldn't play. It would be the third act on, and, and um, there'd be 11 people there or something, and just go, like, what the hell am I doing with my life, you know? And just feeling like uh, it took forever. And, and now, you know, like I, we were talking about before, it's, it is well, a... Well, can I interrupt you real quick? Yeah, please why, do. Why did, you, why did you feel like... Because I felt the exact opposite. Like, I remember when we showed our very first tour stop, St. Petersburg, Florida. There were six people who showed up, eight if you count me and Ryan. And I was like, oh, my God, this is what I'm doing with my life. Um, and it never felt to me like, I mean, we ne- granted, we never had zero people show up, almost. Um, and and, uh, and it, I don't know, maybe it, it just felt to me like, wow, if someone's here to listen, then I want to sort of... Yeah, I, I don't get this out there. Um, I, I totally understand the grind of driving 12 hours through Arizona also, waking up in a rest stop and, and sleeping there the next night. Uh, we've done that as well. Um, it, it feels like, uh, I mean, it, people think they see like the glamour behind, especially a musician's life, like, oh, going out and being a rock star, playing songs in front of crowds of people. But there's the whole other side that's not glamorous at all, right? Yeah, I think that the, maybe the answer to the question is that you, it's exciting to do something that you believe in and put a lot of passion in, like do a book or um, you know a podcast or um, have a Netflix show or make a record. And when I came to Nashville and made a record, um, it was amazing that it, it came out over, all over the U.S. It came out in, in Europe and Canada, and you you feel like. Um, it's, it's really exciting, and then you get to go do things like some of the first tours that I got to do were um, opening for people like Bruce Springsteen's wife, and like I met Bruce Springsteen the first like month I was doing music. I moved to Nashville, I was like, well shit, this is pretty easy, you know, you just make a record, next thing you know, you're hanging out with Bruce Springsteen, and uh, so you have, those, you have those times when just like these great, fantastic things happen, and you're, you're playing, one of the first shows I played was like for 5,000 people opening for John Mellencamp, and then you kind of feel like all right, like I arrived, and then the, and then you're like back to Tucson, Arizona, back to reality. Five people are here, and there's just so many um, ups and downs where uh, it's sort of a check for like, why am I doing this? Am I doing it for the right reason? And I think you know, actions kind of speak, tell the truth. And I, I've just like kind of kept going for whatever reason because it's what I do, it's what I love doing. And the point be- behind saying that too is is just really how appreciative it's made me when I go to a town where there are 100 people or 200 people or 300 people when I see people there after how I know it can go and how much hard work it's taken. It's, it's gratifying, you know, so it, it, it fills me with a lot of gratitude. So, 
No, that's, I think that's a great point, man. Um, you know, what really stands out to me is that you, you were doing something that you knew was meaningful. And um, I, I, I'm curious to see if you feel this way. So we are raised in the, in the Western world, especially with the idea that if you find something you love to do, you never work a day in your life. How do you feel about that? I'm just curious. Oh, I'm, I mean, I've... This isn't a gotcha question. I'm just... No, really I grew up with a really uh, hardworking, I don't know if you can call it Midwestern work ethic, but just um, hardworking family, lots of farmers around where I come from, just, just sort of like get up, work hard, and go about it. And so that came with what I do. And um, I, enjoy, I can't really do it any other way. I feel yeah. good when I work that way. And um, I don't know, I, I just, it's never... I've never had a non-willingness to do that. And when I find myself at home where I'm not uh, staying busy, I sort of don't know what the hell to do with myself. <laughs> so I kind of, maybe that's a bad thing, but I'm, these days it's sort of like, how do I find a balance between taking care of myself and not having to be some sort of a workaholic, but um, just really have a balance in my life. And So what I'm hearing you say is you work really hard still. Yeah. And you do love what you do. I do. And, and yeah. you know, I love what I do. And it's, you know, I, I personally, I think that that is a unreasonable expectation. I think that there are, there's someone out there who certainly wakes up every day and they're like, oh man, I'm so happy. That's great. But for every single person to expect that, it's, it's uh, I just, like I said, I think it's an unreasonable expectation because Josh and I, we love what we do, but we work really, really hard. So I'll say the first thing to the business model is work really hard. <laughs> And I know that's like really simple, but again, that's what we do. We're the minimalists. Mm -hmm. um, but no, work really hard. And uh, when it ever becomes, we're at, when it ever comes to a point where you feel like you shouldn't be doing, like if you honestly are questioning to yourself, like, man, am I in this for the right reason? Maybe I'm not. Um, this is affecting my relationships or it's affecting my health. Like that's when you want to look at it and say, okay, like maybe this isn't for me. Um, but as long as it's aligning with your values and beliefs and, and you're working super hard at it, I mean, that whatever you're doing is going to turn into something successful. Now, the level of success, I don't know. I mean, does that mean you're going to be a millionaire? But you, probably not. But will you be able to pay the bills? Like, that's, that's what I thought. When Josh and I, when we went on that first tour, it wasn't about like, oh, man, how can I replace, you know, uh, <laughs> this, this salary with another big salary. I mean, it was, it was about like how can I live a life that aligns with my values and beliefs? And it started with um, the, the tour. And I thought eventually I'd have to get a job as a barista to kind of help supplement uh, my income. The reason being is, is because that would still allow me to write and it would still give me flexible hours in, in a part-time barista job to do the things that I loved. Um, you hit the nail on the head, man. It is adding value. If I had to add to that, I would say find the biggest need right now with your audience and, and fill that need. Because here's the thing, like when Josh and I, we didn't charge for anything for that first year. It was all essays we were writing. We were just, you know, we, we had some really cool ideas, cool conversations, and we were able to put them in words and, and put them up on the website. As soon as, you know, as soon as we, um, you know, launched uh, Josh's writing class, my mentoring services, when we, when we published our first book, um, it was not, uh, it wasn't, you know, this, this flood of sales, but what it was, it was enough for Josh and I to pay our bills. That first year, um, I think I was looking at like my social security statement. It was like $23,000 I made that year, but I traveled more that year than I had ever traveled. I had more fun that year, just, you know, going out and meeting people. And to me, it was never about, again, about having a big salary. It was about doing something that I loved that was meaningful work and that would allow me to still pay the bills. If you're on that track right now, I mean, really keep going, dude. That's, that's what you got to do. Cause you know, when I look at someone like you, you got two kids and a wife, you got a family to take care of. Um, you know, now you've got a kid and a family. Like if, if something, if shit was to hit the fan with the minimalists or with, um, you know, Griffin's music, like I know he's got a good work ethic and he's going to find something else that he loves to do. And he's going to work super hard, hard at it. And again, that will get to a, a certain level of success. What level that is, I don't know, but Keep doing what you're doing, man. You're going to be fine. Here's a, here's a pithy answer for you. Um, if you're just getting started, say yes till you have to say no, and then say no until you have to say yes. That's good. Thank you.
All right, y'all, quick interruption. If you want to listen to our bonus episode this week, as well as all of our past bonus episodes, head on over to theminimalists.com and click donate at the top of our website. Each week, we publish The Minimalist's private podcast exclusively for our Patreon supporters. This private podcast shows up in your normal podcast feed, like Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Google Play, or whatever podcast app you use, and it shows up right next to our normal weekly podcast you know, the one you're listening to right now. And being a Patreon supporter also gets you first access to the best tickets to all of our live events, as well as access to our monthly private live stream video, which is called Ask the Minimalists Anything. It's worth noting that none of this money goes to me or to Ryan. Instead, we're using your contributions to build a new podcast and film studio in Los Angeles so that we can create more meaningful audio and video creations. If you already support this podcast, thank you. I know that $2 often doesn't sound like a lot of money. I mean, it's less than a cup of coffee, but it is your support that keeps this podcast 100% advertisement free because advertisements suck. And if we can just get 2% of our audience to support this show, then we'll have enough funds to produce some amazing new creations. Your support is truly appreciated. All right, y'all, back to the regular show. Actually, you know what? We'll go back to the regular podcast, but I do want to add one other thing to what you, you were just saying there um, about the, the 24-hour, so on, on the podcast, we were, the private podcast we were just recording, the 24-hour news cycle you're talking about, how everything is breaking news now, right? And I think our mind is, has a really hard time discerning between like... Um, Whatever that the top headline is, so you get a newspaper and like it's whatever's above the fold is there's a 27 people shot in Sutherland Springs, Texas, right? We were we were just down in Houston when that happened, and that's the main thing on the, the headline of the paper. And then the next day, it's like Kim Kardashian West gets into a fight with with Kanye, and that's also above the fold. And you're like, well, wait a minute, like. All, all of a sudden, our mind treats that the same exact way. And we, we, if we don't pay attention to what we're letting in, then it all becomes an emergency. And back to what Griffin was talking about there, when we start focusing on everyone else's problems, uh, it might make our problems seem, seem uh, less significant. And, and then we don't work on fixing those problems at all because we're always just worried about the problems in the world and... If we don't look inward, then that's a problem. The other word you used was propaganda. And man, we were just over at, uh, Bex and I, we went over to the, the Frist Museum. And seen that exhi- I saw that exhibit in Tulsa, the one you're talking, the, the World War I exhibit. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Fascinating. There's this World War I exhibit over there, and there are all these propaganda posters. And I mean, some of them are quite dated. Like there's this one where it's this woman who's like dressed like scantily clad in a Navy uniform. And it's like, I wish I was a man so I could join the Navy. <laughs> and you just imagine, like there were some guys who were like, wow, she'd probably think I was attractive if I went and died from this cause I don't know anything about and, and, and then it's really about okay I, I need to stay I need to stay informed is this the right decision not just let this propaganda make the decision for me and so keep that in mind whenever you're seeing an advertisement it is propaganda there are there are advertisers there are demographers there are a lot of people who uh, went to Ivy League schools to try to divorce you from your bank account and they do a really good job at it. We, we, every year we spend $1.2 billion on non-essential goods. That's, that's stuff we don't need, by the way. Uh, we spend um, 200, uh, so it's, that's 1.2 trillion. We spend 200 million, or 200 billion, sorry, on, on uh, charitable giving. So we spend a, a trillion less on giving to people who need it than on buying stuff that we don't need. And, and so it's, it's just something to think about. Griffin, I want to thank you for being here with yeah, us tonight, man. I'm such an honor to be here with you guys tonight. Thank you. Thank you Thanks very much, man. Much. Thanks. Yeah. If you, you all leave here tonight with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Yes. Thank you, Nashville. Off. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Adrian, and I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina, and this message is in response to the Happier podcast that just aired. 
Um, you guys were talking about meditation and how it could possibly lead you to a dark place if you have never done that before and you spent like maybe a long time in meditation and I just have a lot of insight into that. I just wanted to share that, yes, it could bring yourself to a dark place. However, for me personally, I was able to uncover a lot of traumatic events that I've suppressed since childhood through meditation. And although that led me to a very dark place, Initially, it led me to where I am now, which is a much happier version of myself. Um, so I just wanted to share that for listeners who may be turned off by that idea. Um, I think that it is worth it So to meditate. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, my name is Joseph, Joseph Zumach, and I, I live in um, uh, Cliff, New Mexico, which you'll have a hard time finding on the map. Uh, <laughs> Because it's the boondocks. But at any rate, uh, I've been listening to your podcast for a while now. Um, I'm fascinated by uh, your uh, what you're doing. Um, minimalism is the first ism I felt drawn to in recent memory. I've listened to a number of your podcasts. I must say I'm quite impressed at your articulation of something I've felt for most of my life. Starting in my teens, I came to a point of critical awareness That would be 40 years ago, when I dropped out of college to reconsider my options. For me, the decision was a visceral one, initially resulting from my low tolerance for emotional and psychological stress. I moved out to a place where I could squat rent-free for a while in the mountains of New Mexico. I loved it. I paid off student loan of a few thousand with a part-time job in a couple of years, living without a car, and by depending on my bicycle, I managed quite well, enjoying my life in general, except for a certain degree of isolation. I've always been debt adverse, and uh, aside from the above and the occasional medical debt, I've avoided indentured servitude. I developed a unique style of living where I would work for a period of time, save money, then quit and play for a while. I love having free time and spend most of my free time in nature backpacking, which is an excellent way to practice minimalism by limiting my material needs to what I can carry on my back. As I have aged, I've become more interested in community and decided 20-some years ago to find or create a community where I could retire without a great deal of wealth to buffer me. (laughs) I was recently listening to a financial podcast and thought I would share my approach as an alternative, at least. It has been a very challenging but rewarding process that has led to my current situation, which is living in a rural, intentional community. So my retirement plan is a unique blend of developing relationships of mutual support in this community that I live in, combined with developing skill sets like herbalism, gardening, plumbing, carpentry, that work well with uh, in a remote rural economy of exchange. Hey guys, I'm Lou and I'm calling from Atlanta, Georgia. Last month, my home was robbed and as a single mom living with only my young son, it's been really crazy dealing with the emotions around feeling so totally violated and having my possessions stolen. I found your podcast actually around the same time as the robbery and listening to it has been such a huge comfort for me. Understanding that the items that were stolen, some replaceable, some completely irreplaceable, like the family jewelry my grandma passed down to me, understanding that those are just items, they're just things. The person who entered my home and took my things can't take the memory that I have of the look of joy on my grandmother's face when she gave me her jewelry. What really matters to me can't be stolen from me. And the silver lining is that now I have less stuff. Can I use the stolen items toward your 30-day minimalism game? I think it's still too soon to make jokes, but I just wanted to thank you for the podcast and the work that you do. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need 
Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it Every little thing that you gotta have Every little thing that you gotta have You gotta reach for and you gotta grab Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it So tear your eyes away Or tear 